Hello there, old and new friends. Welcome to Divine Musing, episode 48, It Took a Woman, Hannah. I am Destiny Rambo Corey, and I am so thankful that you have joined us, me and my dear husband, Joel, for this journey into scripture, literature, poetry, and prayer as we view them in the light of transformation and growth. Here's something we've been thinking about lately. I am so excited to be talking today about Hannah. It's been a while since we've done a It Took a Woman episode, and I've known that Hannah was going to be the next woman that I wanted to feature, um, but I wasn't quite sure how to tell her story. And so I don't like talking about things until I really have like mulled them over for a while. I don't like rambling just about a a topic until I, I know exactly what I want to pinpoint and I want to say. So I've been sitting on Hannah's story um, just waiting for Revelation to come to really talk about her in a way that I felt like was going to be meaningful. And then uh, we were asked to speak at a ministry uh, school not too long ago. And Joel was asked to teach on the life of King David. And sure enough, he begins his teaching on the life of King David with the story of Hannah. And I was just blown away and realized that I'm not the one who's supposed to talk about Hannah. It's you. <laughs> and so I asked Joel if he would be willing to come on as a special guest and to talk to us today about Hannah. Um, because I just, I believe the Lord's given you such a real revelation of her story and of her life. And I think her story is so important for us to understand today in the day and age that we live in. Um as people, but especially for women, we have most of our audience who listens and watches are women. Um, there are some men in there. I am, uh, I'm not pushing you out. Um, but I think Hannah's story can relate to everyone. Um, and so I, I want to ask you just a question before you get going, because I know you've got a lot to talk about today. Today's episode is going to be a little bit longer, um, but that's okay. We're, we're diving into Hannah today because she is important. Um, but I, I'm so curious, when you tell the story of King David, you always start with Hannah's story. Why, why is she so important to include in that narrative? That's a great question. Um, before I answer that, and I am okay. going to answer that, I just want to say what an honor it is to sit on this couch Aww. and to be a part <laughs> of your series uh, as an editor and a collaborator with you on this. I've had the pleasure of listening to every episode and they have gotten better and better and better and they have so enriched and blessed me and it's mm -hmm. been such a joy to work with you on it and to be a part of it and i can't I, i'm just excited to sit on the couch <laughs> and be a part of um one of your divine musing episodes i i really am Thank thrilled you. and Thank so you. thankful that you asked me to be a part of it um i think the reason that i love to start with hannah first of all is because my spiritual father, Ray Hughes, mm -hmm. when he would tell the story of David, the life of David, he would always start with Hannah. And I think for me, it always resonated because it's another picture of God beginning with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. That's Hannah so was desperate. She was fighting for a promise, but she didn't know how great the promise was that she was fighting for. Wow. Um, and so as you get into her life, you see this beautiful picture of a woman who is desperate, mm. yet she has the full love and support of her husband. Mm. And so you can see this beautiful contrast that I think so many of us experience in life where we can look around our life and say, things are really good. I have a wonderful family. I've got a community. I've got these things that I'm really grateful for but there's something else that I'm fighting for, right, you know? Right. And so I think it's an amazing way to begin the life of David is by going back to that root of where the prophecy and the prophetic begins that really lays the foundation for his life. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So where do we, where do we first hear about Hannah? Where does her story begin? So w Hannah's story begins in the first book of Samuel. Okay. 
uh, chapter one. And Samuel is the prophet who lays the established foundation for King Saul and then King David, and then his sons even take it further. But Samuel really bridges the gap and starts to see the fulfillment of things that were first prophesied by Moses. Oh, wow. Okay, so so going back that far. Right. So things that had been sort of spoken about but not yet fulfilled, Samuel as a spiritual leader and as a judge starts to bring those things into completion and starts to bring them into uh, the tangible world. And so he's a really remarkable character. And the, the story of Samuel begins in chapter one with his mother. Okay. So, uh, spoiler alert, by the way. <laughs> spoiler, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the story begins with a man named Elkanah. Elkanah. And Elkanah had two wives. Okay. Uh, one of his wives, his oldest wife, was named Panina, and his youngest wife was named Hannah. Okay. Uh, Panina had bore him many children, uh, but Hannah was barren. Okay. And so our story begins with uh, this relationship between Hannah and her rival, Mm. uh, the second wife of Elkanah. And they're on a journey to Shiloh to offer sacrifices and to worship the Lord. Okay. And it says in chapter one that her rival, that Panina would uh, antagonize her and provoke her all the way to the temple and all the way back. And so year after year, Hannah has to go through this process of really exposing her barrenness Mm. and exposing um, what to many at the time would feel like a curse from God. Does scripture give any indication of if there's a reason for her barrenness or does it just say she's barren? I've always been curious about that. It says that God had closed her womb. Wow. Wow. So it, it, her barrenness really at that time and in that culture was seen as God judging her harshly. Mm. And whether or not that was true, that mm. was the consensus and that was the belief at the time. Wow. Um, Hannah's very name means grace. Mm. So she was grace without fruit. Whoa. Yeah. There's a teaching in that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she carried grace, but yet she was still fruitless. And there's this moment where she's so grieved and she's so downhearted um, that Elkanah pulls her aside as her husband and says, I love you. And it's apparent that I love you. I give to Panina to offer sacrifices, but I give you a double portion because Panina might have my children, but you have my heart. Mm -hmm. Like that was the consensus. That's sort of the summary of what he's saying. I don't want to add to the scripture or take away, but the the basic feeling of what he's communicating to her is you have my heart, you have my love. You know, I, I, um, I, I give my body to Panina in the family way, Mm -hmm. but you, I love, I live for, not just live with. Is that not enough? Wow. And I believe that Hannah was carrying a promise. Mm. She knew Elkanah's love was great, and his support of her is profound throughout the entirety of the story. Mm. But there was something inside of Hannah that was not yet fulfilled. Wow. Well, I mean, you started this off by saying this is a story of God starting with the end in mind. And so part of me, just this early on in the story, is like, Well, if it says that God closed her womb, maybe they were interpreting it as barrenness, but God was just saying it's not time yet. Hmm. That could be. I know that there was something in her that was desperate for the fulfillment of that promise. Mm. Um, Because even in that time when Elkanah was saying, am I not enough? I I believe that there was a part of her that was so grateful for her husband's love. And I think we all can find ourselves in that place of divine tension. Mm where we can say, God, we're so thankful. We're so grateful. We're so full of gratitude for everything you've given us. We are so thankful for our friends and our community and and what you're doing in our lives and these little miracles that we see throughout the day. Right. But then there can also be this other part of us that says, but I know that there's more. Yes. Right? Like, I know there's more. And I love that picture in the Psalms where it says that we would be as trees planted by living waters. Mm. 
And when you think about that, the reason the tree never withers or fades is because there's living waters running by it. But those roots go deep and roots draw. Mm. And so I feel like that, that hunger and that thirst in us is that drawing of the spirit when it's applied rightly. I I know there's been times in my life where that hunger or that thirst, it it almost became a stumbling block of disappointment Mm. or frustration or feeling like, God, where are you? I know there should be more because I've got impatient with this process. (laughs) Um, Hannah, thankfully does not. She, she definitely grows desperate. She reaches a moment, a boiling point where she's like, no more. Okay. But she allows that desperation to be expressed as intercession and prayer. Wow. So she takes her desperation to the Lord instead of turning it into an accusation that, God, what you've given me isn't enough. Mm-hmm. She allows her desperation to become intercession and prayer. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, so that boiling point, um, tell us about that. Yeah. So... <laughs> There's this amazing moment where it's in chapter one, verse 10. It says, Hannah, she greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Mm. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come upon his head. Now it came about that as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart. Only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. I love this picture. This is a picture of a prayer so sacred and a prayer so intimate that to to create sound from the mouth would almost break the sobriety and the severity of the moment. Wow. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I I, I resonate with that. I've had those moments where it's like it, it it's wanting to come up but it's like any kind of noise would just ruin the yeah. intimacy of like I know God is listening and he's here and I don't have to scream or even vocalize for him to know exactly what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. There's a song that you and I released two years ago, I think called your love I receive. Mm -hmm. And there's a line in the chorus that I wrote one night when I was suffering a severe anxiety attack. Mm -hmm. And finally the anxiety broke and the lyric to that song just poured out of me. I I showed you the voice memo. Yes, I whispered it into my cell phone and it just poured out from my heart. And the chorus of that is when I whisper your name, you are near me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can only get out the most faint of sounds. Our hearts are so raw. Our hearts are so desperate. Our hearts are so attuned to his spirit that the sound of our own voice almost feels like a clanging cymbal. It like breaks the power of that connection. And so Hannah is desperate. Mm -hmm. She is distressed. She has basically brought herself to the temple and cried out to God with it from the depth of her heart, pouring her heart out before God uh, and praying just by moving her lips without even a sound being made. Um, I think an interesting thing that kind of shows a little bit of the context of the temple during that time was Eli, the chief priest's reaction. Okay. Um, It says in that same verse that we were just in, verse 13, it says, As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. (laughs) <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that that makes you almost beg the question, one of two things. Either he had become so accustomed to a system of spirituality that was based on rituals and posturing and mm-hmm. people coming to the temple basically to flaunt their wealth or to show how righteous or holy they were. Right. Um 
And so to see someone pouring their heart out to God mm-hmm. was so unusual mm-hmm. and so out of the normal right. that his first instinct was, this woman must be drunk. Wow. Or it had become such a ritual and a party and a festival type atmosphere that a lot of people came to the temple drunk. Sounds like some churches I know today. <laughs> but either no judgment, just, but either yeah. <laughs> but either way, you see that Hannah and her distress and her desperation was breaking open the formality mm-hmm. and breaking through the wall of what the expectation and what the religious context was of her day. Right, right. And I think there are times in each of our lives when we become so desperate for God and we become so in need of His immediate touch in our lives that we cannot be bothered by formalities, Mm. uh, the protocols. You know, I think of the woman of with the issue of blood pressing through the crowd. Yes. Uh, she didn't care what people think. She didn't care what she looked like. Right. She knew that if she but touched the hem of his garment, that she would be healed. I'm so curious. Um, and I've wanted to ask you this, um, like what the protocol would have been in that time for women in the temple, like coming to worship. Um, because it's unusual to me that the priest would be so bothered seemingly by a woman um, having such an intimate moment with the Lord. Like were like, clearly they went every year to go make their sacrifices, but so women were allowed in the temple at that point. Women were allowed, but you have to understand that the temple at that time, Eli was, in a lot of ways, a righteous priest, but his two sons were uh, had fallen quite far from the tree. Okay, and so there was a crust of corruption okay. within the temple, and a lot of what was taking place during that time, like I said, was posturing. Okay, it really wasn't about people coming and giving authentic worship to God. I see. It was about people coming and and showing off what they had to offer, okay. and making sacrifices that were grand and kind of a prideful show of what they had that they were able to give to God. And okay. so and so it, I, I don't think that it had as much to do with her being a woman or man. It had much more to do with the condition of her heart. Okay. That was distinct to Eli. That was right. something that I don't know he had, if he had seen in, you know, ever. Wow. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Cause something about this moment clearly got his attention. Right. And so I've I've been so curious if there was anything beyond just the fact that she was praying in such a way that was unusual at the time, if there was more to it than that. Yeah, no, I mean, because even as it goes on, he never sends her away. Mm -hmm. He never rejects her or says, why are you in the temple? Mm -hmm. Um, His thought continuously is, why are you drunk? (laughs) So, yeah, so I don't think that there was maybe the sort of... um, patriarchal misogynistic tones that were taking place in the in the temple at that time okay. as much as there just wasn't a lot of authentic worship and the authentic expression of people's hearts to God during mm. that time right which i don't know which is more sad but they both are awful yeah <laughs> and the fact that Eli the priest was so taken back that his only rationalization for what he was seeing is that Hannah was intoxicated. It just shows the heart of, of people toward God during that time. Yes. Wow. And so then in verse 14, Eli says to her, how long will you make yourself drunk? Mm. Put away your wine from you. And so it's this extreme like demoralization of this woman who had just poured her heart out before God who had felt in a lot of ways shunned by God and mm-hmm. not not given the mark of his goodness and favor upon her life that she would be able to bear offspring. And now the religious elite of the day are also looking down upon her and in a lot of ways um, 
casting a false accusation against her. Right. That right. she was intoxicated and that this was the reason. And she's yeah. like, <laughs> you know, and her response is really beautiful. Um, in verse 15, she says, No, my Lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. Mm. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Mm. I love that beautiful picture because, of course, if we're pouring wine, if we're drinking wine, if we're drinking strong drink, we're pouring out the drink. She's saying, I am not intoxicated Mm -hmm. on things of this world, but I am myself pouring out my heart like wine. Mm. I'm pouring out my prayers and my supplications to God because I'm a I'm oppressed of spirit. Mm. And even that a picture of her being oppressed is like the wine being pressed. Mm. So she's literally it's painting beautiful. this beautiful picture of saying, "No, I am the grape that's being that's being mm. pressed and what I'm pouring out now is the fruit and the passion of my soul." Man, that is powerful. And so then she begins to plea with him and say do not consider your maidservant as a worthless woman. For I've spoken until now out of my great concern and provocation. And then in verse 17, Eli answered and said, Go in peace and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. Mm-hmm. And I love this. She immediately responds and says, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. And she went away and ate. And her face was no longer sad. Wow. Before she was pregnant, before she had even had relations with her husband, Mm -hmm. she received her promise from the Lord by faith. Yes. I find it so interesting as well that when he sends her away, like the two things that he says, like, may God grant your petition. But then, and you know, that you have asked of him, but then, sorry, I was, I was skipping ahead to verse 18. It says she went her way and she ate. I've always found that curious that they, like they specifically mentioned that she left and then she ate. Part of me wonders, like I know in my life when I felt times of depression and times of inner turmoil, I don't eat Mm -hmm. like eating just makes me feel worse and so it makes me wonder if in her state of just being pressed and pleading before the lord if she hadn't eaten oh absolutely yeah it says and so the first thing is she ate and then and she was no longer sad like i think that goes hand in hand it does in verse eight elkanah her husband says to her hannah why do you weep and why do you not eat and why is your heart sad Am I not better to you than 10 sons? So she had, it's yeah, been she, a pattern that she's not taking well, she care was of herself. So, she was so distressed and she had been so grieved by Penina provoking her and antagonizing her that she she had shut down. Wow. She had stopped eating and she was weeping and she was in that state of depression and despair that I think we've all brushed up against or even lived in for certain seasons Uh, That, you know, where our heart is so grieved and where we're so broken before the Lord and broken in our own lives that we just stop. Right. You know? Right. But I love that at the word of the Lord, at just the hint of his favor, that she went and ate. Yes. And her countenance lifted. Yes. Because even though in the natural, in the physical, she was not yet pregnant, Mm -hmm. I believe that in that encounter and in that temple, when Eli blessed her and sent her on her way, that she received the promise of the word of the Lord. And in that way, and by faith, mm-hmm. she was already impregnated with the promise. Wow. Before we move on to her being impregnated with the promise, I wanted to go back because I love in verse 11, when it says that she made a vow talking about Um, the things that she would do when she was given a son. She's very specific about believing for a son. And when she says like, she will give him to the Lord. And then there's a reference here that says that a razor shall never come on his head. What I've, I've heard kind of different takes on what like 
not having your head shaved meant in these days, but can you, but does biggest, that mean that he would be a Nazarite or what is, so what does that mean? Elkanah <laughs> was, her husband was actually of the Levitical priesthood. He was a Levite. Okay. Um, but not letting a razor touch your head. Um, the Nazarites did it, but it was oftentimes used in many different religions as a sign of being set apart unto God. Gotcha. So it's basically saying he will be set apart from his childhood to the rest through the rest of his life. Wow. As a symbol, a razor will never touch his head. Okay. And that was one of the main vows that showed that you had dedicated your life to God. Okay. And so basically what she's saying is, and this is where I feel like it's not it's not this strictly selfish prayer that she's praying and it's not this base desire to uh have a child that she's praying from there's a deeper promise inside of her right and right. so even in her vow she is prophesying over Samuel's life, mm. that he will be unto the Lord and he will be for service in the house of the Lord right. all the days of his life. And so that's where I know that this isn't a moment of like, you know, Hannah making this barter with God, like, right. if I win the lottery, I'll build a orphanage mm -hmm. or something, you know, but really I want, you know, 20 million for myself and I'll give you a million. Right. It, it really isn't that she, cause she's saying, i this is the thing that is most precious to me mm -hmm. right now, and I will give it to you. Right. And that in and of itself is a beautiful picture it really of worship is. and devotion. It really is. I love that. So we pick up in verse 19, and they wake up early in the morning. They worship the Lord, mm -hmm. and they return again to their house, and Elkanah and Hannah have relations and it says the lord remembered her so yeah. almost immediately yeah it sounds like the it. <laughs> promise is fulfilled and this starts this amazing process of now the fulfillment of the promise mm -hmm. in hannah's life what is she going to do about it yes that to me is always the mark that is always when the real test of our faith begins. Mm. It's when the so, prayer is finally answered. When the answered. prayer <laughs> is answered, how many times do you see, you know, someone works and they pray and they live their whole life believing God for a miracle or believing God for a certain thing. And then once they have it, mm -hmm. that faith starts to slip. Right. Or they begin to lose themselves in the thing that they prayed for. Mm. Um, Hannah does the opposite even going so far that once she has samuel she tells elkanah i don't want to take him to the temple until he is weaned which to me is this picture of i don't want to present him and i don't want to bring him into this environment where there is corruption mm -hmm. and where there is a uh, spiritual We'll just say hypocrisy. Malpractice. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm not going to take him into this environment until he's strong enough mm -hmm. to fend for himself. Okay. I've always wondered like what weaned there means. Like, did it mean that like he was done like nursing? Did it mean that he was like walking and talking? Like I've always been curious kind of age wise what that is if there's any indicator of like how actually like old he would have been at this point mm -hmm. when she was saying she would bring him back. Yeah. There isn't a real defining timeline as okay. to how long it took. There is a mention of a three-year-old bull that they take to sacrifice when she finally does take Samuel to the temple to present him. But I think it, I think all of your questions, it's yes. I think okay. it's, he needs to be strong enough to stand for himself. I think okay. he, they, they speak about him later on worshiping. So I think mm. he has to be old enough at least to communicate or, you know, definitely strong enough to eat and feed himself. Yeah. Because basically what she's saying is when I take him there, mm -hmm. I am leaving him there. Wow. 
And so she was taking him to a place where he, she could, he could be prepared, where he could be strong enough to sustain mm. through whatever he might encounter. And I think that it really shows her heart because you can imagine that after years of being ridiculed and criticized and judged for what she didn't have, mm-hmm. how naturally thrilling it would be and how exciting it would be to finally show off and yeah yeah <laughs> come in with that baby <laughs> right look at what god did like yes. hey remember when you made fun of like mm-hmm. look at what god has done for me i mean that would be such a fulfilling brag right right um and i know we can mask it as praise but it would just feel good yeah it would feel good it would just feel really <laughs> good and so for her to uh withhold her withhold that from herself and abstain from that feeling and that, you know, satisfaction of getting that feeling and that, that response back from everyone who had ridiculed her right. shows that she was more passionate about the promise mm. than she was about her position and her rank and the way that other people viewed her. Yeah. Her entire goal at that point was to sustain the life of what God had finally blessed her with. Wow. And so she told Elkanah, uh, I will not go up until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Wow. And this, I believe, is profound. Okay. Because all through the Old Testament, we see a lot of relationships between husbands and wives. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, um, a lot of them are very unhealthy and they are not equal partners and there is not a sense of unity. You know, a lot of times you see women treated like possessions and Mm -hmm. um, it's just really, really gross. Yeah. Um, I love the partnership of Elkanah and Hannah. Me too. Because when Hannah says to her, says to her husband, I'm going to wait until the child is weaned. The next, the next verse In verse 23, Elkanah says back to her, do what seems best to you. Mm. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. I can't wait to meet him in glory. (laughs) He sounds just the kindness that Elkanah exudes is just. Well, yeah, even going back to when when Hannah was so brokenhearted Mm -hmm. in that day and in that culture. Hannah would have been a mark of shame Mm. upon the house of Elkanah. Wow. But Elkanah was saying to her over and over again, you have my heart. I Mm. love you. Is my love for you not better than 10 sons? He's trying to reaffirm to her, like, you are loved. You are Mm -hmm. not judged. You are not condemned. You are not shunned. Like, you are my heart. You are my wife. And I I, I think that was one of the first things that really resonated with me in the story of Samuel and in this beautiful picture of Hannah and Elkanah was in, it's one of the very first partnerships between a man and his wife in the scripture Yeah, where there are times that Hannah says, no, I'm not going to do what's expected of me. Mm-hmm. I'm not wow. going to do the religious posturing. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to continue in the, the expectations of this culture uh, because God has done a new thing in my life and we're right. going to live it out in a new way. Wow. We're not going to bring a new day reality and force upon it this old day system, systemic mm-hmm. uh, religiosity. Right. You know, right. and so Elkanah says stay. And so she does. She stays and she eventually, once she had weaned him, it says in verse 26, uh, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. She said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. 
So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. That pronoun he has always confounded me because me they too. don't. I'm so curious which he they're talking about. I believe it's Samuel. Hmm. Because up until then, when they're discussing or talking about Eli, they refer to him as my Lord, Mm -hmm. the priest. And so it's odd to me that they would say, and he worshiped the Lord there. It almost makes me believe that it was Samuel. Because even implying like he worshiped the Lord there, like Eli was already there. Right. So the way that sentence even is laid out is like, I, I do too. I believe they're talking about at that moment in time, Samuel worshiped as he was handed over to the Lord. I'm yeah. also so curious before we go into Hannah's moment of praise that is just powerful. Um, is there any mention of like how Eli reacts to this child being brought to him? Cause I I've always been so curious and he's the priest, he's been the priest, he has these sons, but then this woman brings her son, gives him to the Lord. I mean, he would have still been very young. So yes. there's an immediate responsibility put on Eli for this child because someone in person is going to have to be responsible for this kid, even though he is the Lord's. Is there any mention of like how Eli takes on this moment where Samuel's brought to him? No, it it doesn't. It doesn't go into any deep like details about that. I just always be curious. (laughs) No, Um, I can tell you that at that point, Eli's sons were, they were running a racket out of the house of God. Okay. So they, you know, there were certain um, procedures Mm -hmm. that were set up as far as like the worshiping of God during that time and the offering of sacrifices and what would, you know, the priestly portion taken from the sacrifices. And so Eli's sons, they were basically profiteering off of people's worship. Okay. And they had kind of created a commercial, not kind of, they had created a commercial enterprise around the act of worship. Mm. So I think Eli at that point knew that his sons were not following in his way. And there's a part of me that really does feel that Samuel became the son of Eli's heart. Because even even as their relationship progresses, when Samuel hears the voice of the Lord later in his life, Mm -hmm. the voice that he hears is Eli's voice. Oh, that's right. That's right. He's still pretty young when that happens, right? When he hears... He's getting a little bit older. Okay. He's he's stepping into like his late adolescent, early adult okay. life. So like yeah. 12, 13, maybe ish. Okay. Um, I think a little bit late. I think later than that. Okay. Yeah. So Eli takes on Samuel, and I think that at that point he knew that Samuel represented the future of the priesthood. Mm. I think intuitively he knew because first of all, he was a miracle. Mm-hmm. But secondly, I think Eli could recognize and sense the presence of God on Samuel's life. And so, yeah, he would have been welcomed in the house of the Lord. It yeah. It definitely wasn't like a oh you're casting this kid on me. Okay. No. Any other questions? No, no. Let's we can move forward. I've just I've been so curious what that must have been like for Eli to be given this like promised child to look after. And there, if there was any um, mention of his experience um, in this moment, Um, but that clarified a lot, honestly. Yeah. Um, So Hannah brings Samuel, dedicates him to the Lord. He worshiped there. Um, And then what happens? Well, there's this beautiful picture of Hannah in that moment, lifting her voice and praying a song Mm. to heaven. Um, I know in the scripture it's listed as a prayer, um, but what's the difference between a prayer and a song? I don't think there is a difference. (laughs) I think it's just the language you cry in. Right. It's the voice and expression that you give to that prayer or that Mm. song. 
And I think at that point, the verse before saying, and he worshiped the Lord there, I feel like that as Samuel worshiped the Lord, that in the same way that in the Psalms, it says that God inhabits the praises of his people. I believe that the spirit of God filled that temple. And so when you ask me, what do I think Eli's reaction to be given Samuel, Samuel was, I believe that Eli was experiencing a moment of personal revival. Wow. Because this was yeah. the first real authentic expression of heartfelt devotion and love for God that I think Eli had seen in a very long time and maybe even in his life. Wow. So I think that this moment stirred something in him and awoken something in him that he had even become a bit callous in. Um, One way I know is that in that next section after her prayer, Eli's sons are exposed. It starts to talk about their corruption. Um, There's this old saying that says, apathy is invisible until it's exposed by the light of passion. Ooh, Ooh, say that again. (laughs) (laughs) Apathy (laughs) is invisible until it's exposed by the light of passion. Oh, that's so good. And so you can imagine the light and the purity of what Samuel carried coming into contact and being brought into this system of corruption and this system of immorality. Mm -hmm. And immediately it's like the light gets turned on and you start to see the things that are going on under the radar. Wow. And so, um, in this next chapter, it starts off after after the worship of God and in, in the bringing about of Samuel into the temple. Hannah lifts her voice, and she begins in this beautiful uh, expression of gratitude to God. And after a while, what starts as a prayer transitions into a prophecy. Yes. I'd like to read it. Yes, please. So this is 1 Samuel chapter 2. It says, Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth speaks boldly against my enemies, because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you. Nor is there any rock like our God. Boast no more so very proudly. Do not let arrogance come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and with him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are shattered, but the the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he set the world on them. He keeps the feet of his godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Wow. I mean, what's so just breathtaking about this moment is that This woman who has gone through so much, who's finally experienced her miracle, but then she's immediately giving her miracle back to God. She breaks into the song of thanksgiving, but not far after she's expressed her gratitude and thanksgiving, she begins to prophesy things that are seem to kind of come out of nowhere. It's like she gets caught up in this moment of gratitude. And it's like, instead of her singing this prayer to the Lord, he begins to 
kind of turn the faucet back around and begins to breathe prophecy through her of things that have not been spoken yet. As far as I'm concerned, there are a few things in here that had not been prophesied yet. Am I right? They have been foreshadowed and prophesied, but never in the language with which Hannah prophesied it. And so the powerful thing is Hannah was carrying a promise. She perceived in that moment the promise that she carried and gave birth to was Samuel. Mm -hmm. But Samuel carried the anointing that would later enthrone kings yes, and establish an eternal throne on the earth Mm -hmm. that Jesus one day would sit upon. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes in our lives, there are moments where we are contending for promises and they seem like they're, they seem like they're a tangible earthly promise in our eyes because oftentimes our thoughts are not as high as God thoughts. Right. Our ways are not as high as God ways. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing it unfold in one way, but God's saying, if I could peel back the layers of time Mm -hmm. and right now where you are, you could see everything before you and everything that will come after, you would understand that your offering and your sacrifice, your prayer and your petition, your miracle and your promise is not just for you. Mm -hmm but it's for generation upon generation upon generation yes. that my covenant would be established upon the earth, that my kingdom would come and my will would be done. And mm-hmm. so she starts to thank God in this beautiful song of praise and gratitude. But then, you know, almost right out of the gate, verse four, she starts to say, the bows of the mighty are shattered, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full, she begins to show this picture of the high being brought low Mm -hmm. and the low being brought high. She starts to hint at this theme of the proud and the lofty being humbled and the humbled being Mm -hmm. exalted. Yes. So you have already these hints and these themes of maybe, uh, maybe a picture of a heavenly being. Mm. who's seated with the Father, who's in the Father, being sent low and birthed as a man yes. in a manger, yes. who was the one who was exalted, being brought low. Mm-hmm. Then, even down into verse 6, where she says, the Lord kills and makes, makes alive. alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. I mean, it's like she's prophesying what happened with Jesus in those three days between death and resurrection. Like he goes down and then comes back up like no one else in history goes down to Sheol and then raises back up. (laughs) Raises back up and brings back with him all of those who had gone before. So she starts to hint at this theme Mm -hmm. and she starts to uh, create imagery of the exalted becoming humble the humble becoming exalted and the path that that humble king would take is through the doors of death into Sheol and then being raised up again by God. And it all climaxes when she begins to speak in this language uh, in verse uh, 10. She says, those who contend with the Lord will be shattered against them. He will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed. Mm -hmm. At that point, Israel had never had a king. Like not at all? Never. I don't think I realized that like up until then. So who was, who was in charge with the priests? The priests and the judges. This was during the time of the the priests. So they would oversee And it would not be until Samuel was much older and the people came to Samuel and said, we need a king. We want someone to tell us what to do, that he's pressured into anointing Saul. Okay. But he anoints Saul with a vial of oil. Right. Right. It's a man-made, it's a fragile object, Mm. and it's a limited supply. Mm. It's not until David that the horn is exalted. And David is anointed with oil. From a horn. From a horn. Wow. So right here, she is prophesying the anointing of David with the horn raised up 
filled mm-hmm. with oil um, because a horn isn't made of, of man. Right. It's, it's a, it's, it's a, comes off of a ram. It's a representation of the sacrifice mm-hmm. and it represents a limitless supply of anointing. Wow. So David was anointed in a way that Saul wasn't. Mm-hmm. And she begins to prophesy that, but not only is she prophesying King David, She's prophesying the throne of David. Right. And ultimately, she is prophesying the Messiah. Mm-hmm. So here we see this beautiful picture that promise begets promise. Mm-hmm. We all have heard that scripture. I feel like it's one of the ones that a lot of people know if they only know one scripture. Yeah. Hope deferred makes, makes the, heart the heart grow sick. sick yeah. Right. <laughs> so we all know that one. Right. <laughs> but the, the following verse says, but a, a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Mm. And so again, we see this picture and I know I'm kind of, it's a callback to what we talked about earlier, Yes. but that tree of life planted by living waters, drawing on the living waters from the root, consistently giving off fruit, bearing the fruit of the spirit. What we see here is this dream that was fulfilled in Hannah's life is now becoming a tree of life Mm. that is now prophesying and speaking into life. Wow. Another mother who will Mm -hmm. give birth to a child. Yes. That is a promise. Yes. Jesus. Jesus. And I think it's a beautiful and Ooh, wonderful before, before you close that, I wanted to I wanted to say one more thing. I wanted you to reference one more thing. Is um she also starts prophesying about herself mm-hmm. in there. She starts speaking over her own life. And I think it's important to reference that in talking about what I think you're about to just say. <laughs> I'm sorry for interrupting you. When um where is it? Um, here in verse five, even the barren. Yeah. So um, in verse five, she says, those who were full hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry cease to hunger. Even the barren gives verse, gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languishes. Here again, we see her. And I do believe in this moment, she's prophesying over herself. Um, but when you go down and see that from this point forward, every time that her and Elkanah would come to Shiloh to worship, they would bring Samuel Mm -hmm. and it says that she would cover him with a linen cloth. Every time she brought, every time she brought Samuel to the temple, make sure that he was covered. And I think again, it was just reinforcing that covering. Yeah. But every time they left... Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, may the Lord give you children from this woman in place of the one she dedicated to the Lord. Wow. And the Lord visited Hannah. She conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Mm. So like in addition to Samuel, in addition, like in addition and, and according to Eli's prayer, the priest's prayer that said, may the Lord give you children in place of the one she dedicated. So this is an addition to Samuel. Samuel. Okay. So she has three more sons, two daughters, Mm -hmm. one Samuel, that's six. Mm -hmm. The prophecy that she prays or sings in verse five says, even the barren gives birth to seven. Mm -hmm. And I believe that what she was declaring was that those who had been given, they languish, Mm -hmm. but she was hungry and now she no longer hungers from this promise and from this miracle, God was also birthing a line and birthing a priesthood Mm -hmm. that would have one, one day far in the future would give us the Messiah. Wow. Because the the seventh son, the seventh son, because, uh, it's Samuel that anoints David to become King. Right. And it's David's throne that is established for all eternity that Jesus sits upon. Mm -hmm. And so, She's basically prophesying that from this moment in the spirit, the Messiah will be birthed. Yeah, so good. And so you can just see that the promise begets promises. Mm -hmm. And that the shift I believe that God is making in all of us is it's never just about you. Yes. Oh, that's true. It is about you. God's faithfulness, God's love, his mercy, 
it's chasing us down every day. Yes. His heart is to communicate to us his never ending love, his unfailing faithfulness. Mm -hmm. So it is about you. I, I've heard yeah. people preach and say, oh, it's not about you. It is. This story is as much God's love song to Hannah mm -hmm. as it is about Samuel and what he will accomplish with his life. Right. It's as much about God's faithfulness to a mother praying and crying out in desperation for her womb to be open yes. as it is the fruit of that womb. Mm -hmm. And so it is about you. Yes. But it's not just not about just. you. That's so good. And I think so many times we can become bottlenecks for God's goodness mm. because we do try to stop it up and make it about us. Yeah. And where Hannah does the exact opposite is one, on the other side of promise, she fulfills her vow. Yes. Yes. It's not like a bargaining no tactic at all because I, I know i'm definitely guilty of that like lord if you'll do this i'll do this and then i get so caught up when the prayer is answered that i i at times i'm getting better about it <laughs> i'm getting better about not bargaining at all right so i think what hannah was doing she wasn't bargaining she was vowing yes like lord if you do this for me it won't actually be for me like this child is yours before you've even given him to me. So there wasn't a bargain in it. It was her saying like, I believe you have promised me this and I want you to know I'm going to give the promise straight back because it doesn't belong to me in the first place. Yes, that's such a great point. And it's true. She makes that vow, not out of a sense to manipulate God, mm -hmm. but to partner with God. Ooh, yes. In the creation of her son. Mm -hmm. So she's not saying, you know, if you give me this, it's not in a ploy to try to pull on God's heartstrings. It's her knowing that God will open her womb mm -hmm. and that f the fruit of that, her most precious gift, she is promising that I will give this to you for all of its life. Mm. Wow. And I think in a time when, like we said, the priesthood was corrupted mm -hmm. and there was a lot of uh, financial gain taking place around the concept of sacrifice, yeah. the commoditization of worship, mm -hmm. which is something that I could preach on today in say, our day yeah, and time. In this day and age, it feels like that is rampant. There is an entire industry mm -hmm. around the expression of worship. Yes. She's saying in this time when worship has been commoditized, in this time where there's a price tag and a profit to be made upon people's worship, mm -hmm. I will offer you the thing that is most sacred, most precious, most valued in my life. I will offer that to you as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And what I love is when she does it and she fulfills the vow that then every year when she goes back to worship before the Lord, Eli blesses her and blesses her with more children mm -hmm. in the place of the one that she sacrificed. Yes. So I, I definitely am going to want you to pray with us before we close today. But before we do that, just on a practical level, you know, this story happened thousands of years ago, but I, I feel like there are so many lessons to be learned in Hannah's story. And if I were to ask you, like, what are some practical things concerning Hannah's story that we can learn from and apply to our lives today that would help us to grow in our, in our faith and in our lives? Are there any things that you can like specifically pinpoint that we can take from this story and, and run with? I think the one that comes to mind, and there's a lot, but yeah. we won't go through all of them. The one that I feel the Holy Spirit has uh, kind of brought to my mind in this moment is that when faced with great distress, great disappointment, frustration, provocation, antagonization. 
Hannah did not turn to the Lord with accusation, Mm -hmm. but she turned to the Lord as a handmaiden Mm -hmm. and she humbled herself and inquired of the Lord and turned her distress into intercession and prayer. And I think right now in the world, it's such a distressing place. It really is. And this is a desperate time Mm -hmm. for all of us. Economically, things have been hard. Mm -hmm. Globally, things are hard. Uh, We're we're in a time and a season of shifting and Mm -hmm. wars and things that can make us feel very anxious. Things that can make the promises that we've held on to feel further from reach than they ever have before. Yeah. And I think my encouragement for all of us in this season is to not allow time, which requires patience, to not allow the the distance of time between us and our promise to create a wall of resentment Mm -hmm. and resistance toward God and toward the Holy Spirit. Because it is during that time that we are in process. I don't know why. I mean, it says in, in chapter one of 1 Samuel, year after year, yeah. they went to the temple yeah. and Hannah was provoked year after year. Yeah. Confronted and faced mm. with her inadequacy yeah. and with her brokenness and with her incapability mm. to produce offspring with her, for her husband. There are things that a lot of us carry that year after year we walk through life with that same shame, with that same frustration, with that same disappointment. Mm -hmm. And year after year we go to God and leave feeling much the same. And we don't know why. Yeah. We don't. It's not, it doesn't say that Hannah was doing something wrong. It, you know, I don't believe in that. It's her lack of faith that, you know, yeah. I don't believe in that. I believe that Hannah was in a process mm-hmm. because only God knew the time and circumstances that it would take before she would release her heart in that way before him. And so I think the takeaway from this, and I think the thing that we can most apply to our life in this day and in this hour is to hold the promise Mm -hmm. to carry on and keep moving forward even when we don't see it coming into fruition Mm -hmm. and to not let that time and to not let that process breed resentment and resistance to God, but instead to let it rise up within us until we can no longer hold it back yeah. and to release it as a prayer yeah. to God. Yes. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Mm-hmm. Will you pray with us and just seal this moment in? I will, but I feel that it would be actually best for you to lead us in a prayer. Okay. I believe this series is called It Takes a Woman. It took a woman. <laughs> it took a woman. <laughs> and I I believe that I will stand with you and agree with you. Yeah. But I feel it would only be fitting for you to lead us in the prayer. Mm. Okay. Let's, let's pray. Oh, thank you, Lord. Divine Creator, we come to you today just with open hearts after hearing the story of this phenomenal woman who took what should have made her bitter, what should have made her resentful, what should have shut her down, what should have silenced her voice and her faith. She took the promise that she knew you had given her and she would not let go. We just draw inspiration and hope and guidance today from the story of Hannah And we are so grateful to you that you allowed her story to live on so that we can continue to learn from it. God, teach us to come to you with our pain and our 
insecurities and with our heaviness. Teach us how to lay it at the altar of worship and to allow you to bring the promise to fruition in your time and to not grow bitter in our waiting, to allow patience to burn within us because we know that you fulfill your promises. We know that you are not a man that you can lie and the seeds that you have planted within us will come to pass. We know that you start with the end and work backwards. And even though we may not be able to see the future from where we're standing right now, we trust that you are the one in the tree who can see the big picture. You can see the whole story and you know exactly where we're meant to be, when we're meant to be there, and when things are meant to come to pass. And so we surrender our need for control we surrender our need for answers right this minute. And though we may be coming to you with prayers that are silent, with only our lips moving because we can't quite figure out exactly how to make the words that need to come out in this moment, we offer you our hearts, Jesus, and we offer you our trust. We offer you the same trust that Hannah offered you every time she went back into the temple to bring her offering and to lift her voice to you and say, God, I'm reminding you of your promise for my son. Lord, we just stand in that place of trust today. And we ask that you meet us in our frailties and our moments of disbelief and our moments of discouragement and use this story of Hannah as a beacon of hope that can tell us and show us so clearly that you are a God who fulfills your word. You are a God who turns our mourning into dancing. You are a God who turns our barrenness into fruit. You are a God who meets us in our tears and turns those tears into songs of praise that they're then turn into songs of prophecy, of deliverance. It all comes back to you, Jesus. You take our moments of worry and our moments of heaviness and you turn them back to prophecies of your goodness because you are always good. We may not understand your ways. We may not understand your practices or your timelines, but we know that we know that you are good and you will fulfill that which you have promised. Mm -hmm. We are so grateful that we can stand on that truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, mess. <laughs> thank you for sharing this sacred space with me. Of course, of course. And thank you for diving into just the brilliant story of Hannah. I, I find so much strength in her story. And I just, I feel like you have such a revelation of it and a grace to tell it well. Mm. And so thank you for taking the time to do this with me tonight. And thank you all for taking the time to listen and to watch. I know this is way longer than what we normally do. Um, but I was thinking that with, with this episode actually being the season two finale, um, after today's episode, we're going to take a little break until the end of the year. I know the holiday season is upon us. We've got lots of family and travel and all the things. And so this is going to be our last episode for 2023. And we will see you back early in 2024 with new episodes of season three. But I'm just so thankful to all of you who take the time to... Uh, to watch and to listen and to give your input, to leave your comments. Um, I love knowing the revelations that the Lord gives you as you're listening to what we're talking about. Um, that just, that's what I've always wanted is for this place to be a place of mutual growth, that we're all expanding our ways of seeing the Lord together. That as we muse over the scriptures, as we muse over the things of God, that he continues to open up new realms of revelation. And so I'm just so thankful for all of you who are on this journey with us. Um, I want to leave, we usually leave our live stream events that we do. I don't usually sign off Divine Musing with this, but I feel like it's important to sign off because we're together. We always end our live stream events by telling you 
that you are seen, you are known, you are loved, and you are always enough. And I hope this musing has given you a little something to think about too.